Hello and good evening, you all. I hope you can hear me and we apologize for a little bit of delay, but I hope, uh, but all is well, everything is working, so do not worry. Uh, please let me know, as always, that you can hear me and well, welcome to our IVF webinar tonight. Uh, welcome back, some of you, I know you have been uh, through our previous uh, event, so happy to see you as well. And well, today we have another topic to uh, tackle. And of course, uh, Stronger Together initiative uh, is all, it has been created for you so that you can simply join our events and get uh, to know some of the top fertility experts from various clinics, from various countries. And of course, um, since we are not able to proceed with the treatments, this way you are able to simply ask your questions and get ready for the treatment when it will be actually ready and stronger together initiative has been brought to you thanks uh, to our partners and ambassadors as well you can see them right here some of them already had a pleasure to to and so they were able to join our ivf webinars or online patient meetings some of them probably you might already know uh, some others will have a chance to to do to present as well uh, very very soon so you need to just stay tuned for when it comes to all of our events and tonight we have a very interesting topic to to tackle ovarian rejuvenation myths and reality and with us is dr cesar diaz uh, who is the medical director at iva clinic located in london uk Hello, Dr. Cesar. How are you feeling tonight? Hi, good evening. Hello, everyone. Perfect. It's good to have you here. And uh, let me just remind everyone that uh, you will be able to ask your question right after the presentation. So go ahead and do it. And uh, remember that uh, Dr. Cesar will simply answer your questions one by one after the presentation. And uh, this is being recorded so you will have a chance to re-watch it once more uh, within the next few days and well that will be it from me at this point uh, Dr. Cesar are you ready to begin? Yes thank you Perfect. thank you very much for the presentation first of all uh, I would like to explain somehow uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna present this evening so starting with uh the explanation of, of, of what we could consider uh, ovarian rejuvenation uh, basically uh, ovarian rejuvenation are different type of techniques that in a clinical setting all of them they aim to uh, to boost to somehow wake up a follicular pool of follicles that they are there dormant in many many patients even in those in which the ovarian function has already stopped. I basically talk about uh, menopausal or perimenopausal women. Uh, we can awake these dormant follicles by basically three different interventions, by infusing growth factors, and this is what we call a uh, platelet-rich plasma, by infusing cells that produce those growth factors, and those are basically stem cells that we can uh, obtain from different sources or by activating other molecular pathways and we basically achieve that by uh, fragmenting the ovarian tissue and this is what i'm going to explain you this evening of course uh, probably you are all aware that uh, the process of ovarian aging will have a tremendous impact in the result of IVF treatments. While uh, infertility in general in the population is present in about 15% of the patients, uh, this percentage varies a lot depending on the age. So while it is only present in 5% of the patients at the age of 20 years, it can go up to 30% in patients at the age of 35. Obviously, the per this percentage is even bigger when we go to older age groups. Basically, what we try to do, or what we try, what we aim to do when we do uh, ovarian rejuvenation techniques, is basically to pass from this scenario in which patients will have very little follicles or even no follicles to 
something like this, which, I mean, this is probably a too exaggerated example, but the idea is that, is that we will increase the number of antral follicles. The antral follicles are the follicles that we will stimulate later on uh, during the IVF procedures. I want to be very clear from the beginning, and this is one of the myths when it comes to uh, ovarian uh, rejuvenation. Uh, I want to explain something very, very clear, and is that the process of aging, in fact, will have two impacts in, uh, in uh, infertility when it comes to the ovarian function. One is what I have just explained, the decrease in the number of follicles. So we will pass from this situation to this one. And the second one is the quality of the embryos. The genetic quality, but also the non-genetic quality, quality related uh, to morphological aspects or uh, biochemical aspects. We know a lot about uh, how the chromosomal abnormalities in embryos generated from different age groups will differ. And for example, at the age of 35 or below, we will barely see chromosomal abnormalities, less than 20, 25% of the embryos will be chromosomally abnormal, while in patients over the age of 40 years old, probably in most of the patients, more than 60% of the embryos are going to be abnormal. Well, there is something that I want to state very, very clearly. As far as I know, nowadays, ovarian rejuvenation techniques will not impact in uh, the genetic quality of the embryos, unfortunately. So what we pretend to do when we do ovarian rejuvenation techniques, as I explained to you previously, is to increase the number of follicles. And we will do it by targeting these small follicles, which are called primordial follicles, which are microscopic, about 25 microns, and try to make them grow to an antral follicle stage in which we can stimulate them with gonadotropins. All these first steps of the follicular growth, they are not depending on the drugs that we give from the outside. Uh, they depend on various mechanisms. Some of them, they are not even completely well known and understood nowadays, but this is what we are gonna target with all these techniques. These follicles, they are sensitive to growth factors. These follicles, they are sensitive to other type of stimuli that could make them grow and could make them activated. As I mentioned, look at the chromosomal abnormality rates depending on the age groups, how they increase with the age. This effect will not be bypassed by ovarian rejuvenation techniques. Uh, and this is something that people uh, tend to forget or do not explain enough to patients. And I think this is very, very important not to create uh, false expectations. Another thing that has to be uh, very well done when explaining this type of techniques and probably is one of the pitfalls that we have nowadays, especially because they are still quite experimental, is the way we report the results. I would say, and just to give you an explanation, that there are bad and good ways of reporting results. If I tell you that I have three perimenopausal women undergoing the procedure and the three of them got pregnant after uh, undergoing the, the procedure, you could probably say, my God, I mean, 100% of them being pregnant, great results. But when we report results of uh, any type of technique, we should also report the denominator. We need to show how many patients have undergone the technique. And obviously, how many patients didn't uh, succeed. And this is what we probably lack the most nowadays when it comes to evaluating and to assessing these type of technologies. There is also uh, other uh, effects that could uh, somehow uh, mislead the patients. And I want to explain them before I go on with the presentation so you will all be aware. Uh, the placebo effect, I'm sure that you would have all uh, heard about the placebo effect. Well, the placebo effect is a real effect. And in order to control for the placebo effect, we usually need a control group. But even having a control group uh, could, could create other, uh, other problems. For example, uh, when I do a, a, an experiment and I look at the control group, 
let's say I count the number of follicles that I see in the ovary when I start ovarian stimulation treatments on day one of the cycle usually or around day one, well, I can see X, Y, or Z amount of follicles. But when I have a control group, something that you should be aware is that I should do exactly the same follow-up that I would do in a group in which I do an intervention. Because for example, in our hands, when we do experiments uh, of ovarian rejuvenation, we usually follow the patients every 15 days. And if I increase the number of follow-ups, there's more chances that I will see more events. Therefore, if I have a control group, in order to avoid what we call detection bias, I would also need to increase the number of controls or follow-ups that I do in the control group. Okay, I want to state this very, very clear before, uh, before starting. In order to control for all these type of uh, potential confounding factors, what we have done in our experience is basically uh, to take everything that we knew before from other settings, for example, fertility preservation in oncological patients. We have been working with ovarian tissue for uh, more than 15 years now. To repeat experiments that other people did modifying certain aspects to see if we could improve the techniques and also do it in a better way when it comes to, uh, to the experimental designs, basically by introducing control groups and eventually by randomizing patients. Now, let me go exactly to the three different techniques that uh, they have been described for, um, for doing ovarian rejuvenation. The first one is the platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma, in fact, is a portion of the plasma when we do the centrifugation of the blood that remains in between the platelet poor plasma and the red blood cells that they go to the bottom. And this portion here is where most of the platelets are gonna be. And the platelets, in their inside, they contain a lot of substances. All these that you can go here, that you can see here, sorry, that I'm not gonna uh, go into. But basically, uh, when it comes to platelet function, they do things such as preventing uh, acute blood loss by repairing vascular damage, by uh, promoting clotting, but they also contain many other uh, molecules that help to regenerate the tissue. And are those the ones that they are going to intervene and regulate cell migration, attachment, uh, proliferation, and differentiation? All those processes are the processes that we need to activate the follicles. And because of these properties, they could potentially be helpful in activating dormant follicles. When it comes to clinical evidence, I have to say that, unfortunately, there is very little done out there or at least there is very little done from a scientific point of view. Uh, there are mainly two groups who have reported uh, the use of PRPs in low responder patients, which is the, the group uh, in Greece, in the Guinea Clinic, and the group in, uh, in Iran. Uh, but I have to say that the group in, in uh, in, in Greece, they have only reported successful cases. They have a series of three patients uh, who, who uh, underwent the process and, and became pregnant, being or having a low ovarian reserve, and another, a second series of patients with a premature ovarian insufficiency or a menopause, and uh, who subsequently also got pregnant. But we don't know how many, uh, how many patients underwent the process is not reported in the papers. So we cannot calculate the efficacy of the process. And in some congresses, they have reported that they have done hundreds of patients. Therefore, maybe the efficacy is not as big. The, the experience reported by the Iranian group is better reported. It's a, an experience in, win, in which they uh, recruited uh, 23 patients. They finally underwent the procedure 19 but they only report results for 12 of the patients. 
In this study, they compared the results before and after the infusion of PRPs. So the patient, each patient was its own out, uh, its own control, so to speak. And in fact, in all these 12 cases in which the results were reported, not for the 23 that were initially recruited, uh, three patients uh, got pregnant. It was patient number 11, number 12, and case number eight. Case number 11 and case number 12 got spontaneously pregnant. And, uh, and, and the case, sorry, it was not case, yes, it was case number eight. Uh, she, she was pregnant after the procedure. This one was a patient uh, which never had eggs before the infusion of PRPs. And then after the infusion, she had seven eggs and she ended up with five embryos. Uh, it has to be said that she underwent five previous ovarian stimulations. So to some extent, uh, well, the, um, the efficacy of the, of the, of the technique uh, is again difficult to be evaluated given the small figures, but uh, there's at least uh, room for hope. Another way of doing uh, ovarian rejuvenation is by introducing the cells who will produce those growth factors. And that we do it uh, by stimulating the stem cells that they are in the bone marrow to go out from the bone marrow to, uh, to go to the peripheral blood. And we can take them out using an apheresis machine. And later on, once we have the stem cells in a bag, we can reintroduce them into the ovary through interventional radiology by uh, perfusing the ovarian, the uterine uh, artery and the ovarian, uterovarian artery. So this is another way of putting those cells that could potentially promote the growth of follicles there. Uh, this is something that we did in our group uh, in my, when I was uh, still working in, in Spain together with my colleague uh, uh, Sonia Reif, we started a trial around uh, a, a, a trial in which we took uh, patients uh, with a diagnosis of uh, low ovarian reserve, no premature ovarian insufficiency. I want to be very clear with that, but low ovarian reserve, and uh, and we mobilize the stem cells and we infuse them again, and we look at what happened in their in their ovaries. We were looking basically at ovarian reserve markers such as uh, serum AMH and also antral follicle counts. And those who met the criteria to start an IVF treatment, they started an IVF treatment. What we, uh, what we saw in this series is that when we compared the patients, we did a, 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 a study design similar to that of the of the Iranian group in which the patients they were their own control. This is what we call an before and after study. So in, in, in this group of patients, what we saw is the antral follicle count was enhanced after doing the infusion of stem cells, what we call ASCO. Uh, we also uh, detected an increase in AMH levels. But I have to be very honest with you. Uh, in terms of the whole population of patients, including the study, we couldn't see an increase in the number of metaphase two oocytes retrieve, mature oocytes, uh, although we saw a slightly lower cancellation rate, which was statistically significant. When it comes to pregnancy rates, obviously, before the procedure, there was no pregnancies, otherwise, the patients would have never been enrolled. But after the procedure, we had three pregnancies after IVF, and also three spontaneous pregnancies, so six pregnancies overall, which again, in this, in this case, the control group was the same patient before doing the procedure. But we have to keep in mind that these percentages, they are really, really above what we could expect uh, in terms of pregnancy rates in, in, in this group of patients with these characteristics. Overall, we have three live births one after uh, IVF and two after spontaneous pregnancies. 
there is a third way of doing ovarian uh, rejuvenation or as I prefer to call it, follicular activation. And is by fragmenting the follicular, uh, sorry, the ovarian tissue. Uh, basically, the procedure, uh, as it is now, is quite uh, simple, although it requires a surgery. We take a biopsy of the posterior wall of the ovary, we process the tissue, and then we introduce the fragments again into the ovary. If the follicles, they are activated, antral follicles will grow after between one month and a half and four months after the procedure, and then we will be able to perform IVF treatments. Uh, this is a simplified procedure that we develop in our group after uh, more than five years of research now. The original protocol was described by the group of uh, Kazuhiro Kawamura and Aaron Shue in Stanford. And in fact, it was a procedure which combined the fragmentation of the tissue. And you would think, how comes that just by chopping the tissue, we can promote follicular growth? Well, that happens because there is a pathway called the Salvador Hypoward pathway, which is inhibited, and that will promote the secretion of growth factors and anti-apoptotic factors. In the original technique, uh, the, the, the authors, they did in a certain way, uh, which I will explain, but basically what they did is that in addition to fragmenting the tissue, they incubated for two days with substances that they also uh, promote the growth of the follicles and uh, avoid uh, follicular death. The results that they initially published and these studies were done in patients with a premature ovarian insufficiency, with an ovarian failure, not a low ovarian reserve, but a proper ovarian failure. What they observed is that they could get those patients pregnant and, uh, and having even live births. But if you look at the proportion of patients with live births, even though the patients were postmenopausal, this kind of events, they can also happen naturally without doing anything. And again, we don't know if this is the effect of the technique or it's just the role of chance. So what we decided to do was to repeat the experiments that they have done, but also adding modifications to improve the technique. Basically, uh, we avoided one step in which they uh, vitrify the tissue in which they uh, fr they had the tissue frozen. By freezing the tissue, the only thing that you can get is to to damage it. You you, you induce cryo damage. We didn't want to 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 vitrify the tissue. Then we also change the place where the tissue was put back. Initially, the tissue the tissue was put back into the fallopian tube, and that's not the right place according to our standards for the tissue to be back. We wanted to look for a better place to put the tissue back and a place that could potentially also allow for natural pregnancy. So by allowing crowd damage, by looking for a better vascularized place where the oxygen can uh, reach the tissue easily, and also by looking for a better vascular bed. So by doing all these procedures, we wanted to improve the technique. And we achieved that by basically transplanting the tissue back into the ovaries. And this is why we arrived to the uh, final technique in which avoiding the incubation of the tissue allow us to do everything during the same surgical procedure and also by avoiding the equation of the tissue, we will avoid these chemic times, we will avoid the lack of oxygen that could substantially and sequentially uh, induce follicular apoptosis, follicular death. This technique has been adopted by other groups also. Recently, there was a paper published by uh, Klaus Edin Andersen in Denmark in which uh, they tested our uh, modified technique and, 
and they did a study in 20 patients to see if they could see any changes. These patients, again, they were not patients with an ovarian insufficiency. They were just patients with a low ovarian reserve. And what they saw is that, in fact, the baseline situation of the biops ovary uh, was, not, uh, was not changing during the process. But on the contralateral ovary, on the other hand, in between week 8 and week 10, there was a slight increase in, uh, in follicles. In fact, uh, at the very end, when it comes to reproductive outcomes, they couldn't see any difference. And these results, they are in line with our randomized control trial in which we tested this technique in patients with poor ovarian reserve. We have not published the results yet, but we did a randomized control trial in which 38 patients were allocated to undergo the ovarian rejuvenation technique or to undergo uh, uh, just observation, which is basically a control group. After six months, if we saw an increase in the number of follicles, we started an IVF treatment. And if we didn't see such increase, in order to control for uh, detection bias, we did the IVF treatment anyways. So all of the patients, they had their IVF treatment, no matter what. And what we saw in this study is that we could demonstrate an increase in the number of antral follicles. But unfortunately, that increase in the number of antral follicles didn't result in an improve in terms of pregnancy rates or, uh, or, uh, or live birth rates. I have to say that the study was not powered to uh, detect such differences. But if those differences exist, probably they must be very little from a clinical point of view. They should not be relevant. Otherwise, we would have detected them. Together with that study, and all as part of the same uh, uh, registered trial, we did a second uh, phase in which all the patients who could not benefit of the first randomized control trial because they already had an established ovarian insufficiency underwent the procedure and underwent the procedure as a, as a prospective court. The characteristics of the patients, you can see them here. They were patients that they were below the age of 40 years old uh, and that was by protocol. They were patients who didn't undergo previous surgeries, organal toxic treatments, who didn't have any autoimmunity against the ovary and who didn't have any genetic conditions motiv motivating their uh, poor ovarian uh, reserve and subsequently ovarian insufficiency. They were patients who virtually had no follicles at all and some of them had undergone previous IVF cycles. We did the procedure. I'm not going to go into the details, but what I want to show is that basically we introduced more or less 140 fragments inside the ovaries after processing the tissue. This is the same slide, sorry. And what we could see is that depending on the pattern of the patients, the response was quite different. And the main characteristics of those patients who responded better to the treatment, the main characteristics were that, in fact, the patients, they had the same age, but the duration of the uh, ovarian insufficiency in general was, uh, was lower. Uh, these patients had what we call an occult POI, an occult premature ovarian insufficiency or parocystic ovarian insufficiency. Those are patients in which the ovarian insufficiency has been established uh, in the last year usually, uh, and they can eventually have a, a menstrual period even after four months of amenorrhea, or they can be completely amenorrheic, but eventually have lower FSH levels once in a while. This is what we call an occult POI. And the most important thing of patients with this occult POI 
is that the success rates, when it comes to not only uh, outcomes related to the cycle, but in terms of pregnancy outcomes, the results, they were drastically different to the group, which they already had uh, an established premature ovarian insufficiency. In fact, we had five out of eight patients pregnant in the occult POI group, while we only had two out of 24 in the uh, patients with an established POI. In fact, we also realized about something that we didn't know when we started the, 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 um, the trial, and is that uh, in patients in which the POI has been there for more than two years, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have any pregnancy. I have also some data that I'm not gonna to present to you uh, illustrating why we cannot modify the uh, genetic uh, chromosomal abnormality rates in, in embryos from, from patients uh, undergoing this technique. Uh, we got permission to do a, a very short series of patients over the age of 40. All of them had embryos. We were able to produce embryos in all of them. Uh, obviously, because of their age, uh, we did genetic testing in all of the embryos before putting them back. Unfortunately, none of the generated embryos in that series uh, were normal. Among the patients who were pregnant, uh, five of the pregnancies uh, delivered already or are ongoing beyond the second trimester. Unfortunately, there were also two patients uh, in which uh, the, the pregnancy uh, terminated. One was a miscarriage and a spontaneous miscarriage. The other one was a pregnancy in which the parents, they decided to terminate because uh, the baby was carrier of a, of a Down syndrome. Uh, I have shown you how this technique could potentially work quite well in patients with a premature ovarian insufficiency, but why? it didn't look to work, to work so well in patients uh, with a low ovarian reserve. Well, of course, there could be potential explanations uh, linked to the statistics, to the fact that uh, the patients with a poor ovarian reserve, they have a baseline condition which is closer to a normal situation than as compared to those of a premature ovarian insufficiency. But there is also a biological explanations for that. We processed the tissue and we extracted uh, proteins and, and, and we look at the, the expression of genes that they are related uh, to these activation pathways. And what we saw, and I'm not gonna go a lot into details because this is very technical, is that if you look at these graphics here, the expression patterns of all the molecules that they are involved in the response is very different. You can see the decrease of, uh, of these lines in this graphic, these correspond to patients with a POI as compared to those with a, a low variant reserve. This is much, much, much more steep. Uh, and this is the degree of phosphorylation of a protein called JAP, which is the protein that is eventually at the end of the process causing the activation of all these uh, um, uh, anti-apoptotic factors and growth factors when we, uh, when we fragment the tissue. So having said that, I would like to summarize uh, today's lecture just by, by giving you some valid, valid points. Uh, and those are points of caution. We have to keep in mind that uh, we scientists, we are trying to develop new and new tools to help you patients, but uh, some of these research projects are still very preliminary. And I think the duty as doctors is uh, to properly counsel patients, not to create false expectations. I think we are in the right way, but uh, still this kind of techniques probably should be done within the context of uh, controlled trials and not be offered as, uh, as uh, established techniques yet because uh, we don't have enough data regarding, the, especially the efficacy of, of the techniques. Uh, the results, they are promi promising though. Uh, based on our studies, the studies conducted in IDI, I would say that we have to be very careful when selecting the patients and try to establish criteria 
in order to offer the technique to the patients who could really benefit of it. Uh, when it comes to uh, ovarian rejuvenation techniques, I would say that if the patients, they still have follicles, even though they have a lower ovarian reserve, probably they are not gonna benefit that much of this type of techniques. These techniques, they aim basically the patients who have already an established ovarian insufficiency. And uh, we are still working uh, to see what are the uh, molecular pathways that could potentially help us to even better select those patients when it comes to offer uh, the ovarian rejuvenation techniques. Uh, I would like to finish just by uh, thanking all my colleagues who have been involved in, in these research projects, especially Dr. Giuliani from uh, IBI Alicante, uh, Dr. Wright from our IBI Foundation, Professor Pellicer, my mentor, uh, which uh, who was uh, with me at the beginning of this project, and also uh, the lovely team that I have the pleasure to to command here in in IBI London. With them, this this type of activities will not be possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Caesar, for all the details for explaining uh, this definitely interesting topic to us and to well uh, lots of information lots of useful information for sure uh, so huge thanks for this and to well um, now it is time for your questions we have plenty of questions ready okay so let's get to them right away and the first question is right here is ovarian rejuvenation suitable for cancer survivors i have had a lot of chemo chemotherapy over 15 years and at age 36 i am now postmenopausal. so the the scientific answer is we don't know because in fact uh i would say that strictly speaking uh not, nobody has tried but it's very, it's very unlikely that this will be a technique of choice in, in, in patients with this, these characteristics, Natalie. Uh, basically, because after chemotherapy, what happens is that the follicles, even the, the primordial ones that we are supposed to stimulate when we do the, when we do the activation of the follicles, they are, they are not there. When, when we give chemotherapy, and that depends a lot on the type of chemo, okay? So take this uh, very cautiously, but when we, when we give chemo, what happens is that even the primordial follicles, they die. And there is also another effect of chemo, which is that it causes an extensive fibrosis of the, of the ovarian tissue, also of the outside of the parenchyma. So uh, I, I have to tell you that in, in my experience, when, when I was leading the fertility, the Spanish Fertility Preservation Program, uh, we, we did this process in, in two patients uh, uh, after passing the ethical committee. And, um, and in fact, uh, the, the, the results, they were, not, uh, they were not satisfactory. We didn't see any increase. Mm, then doing other techniques, like for example, infusing growth factors or, uh, or, or putting molecules uh, such as P10, AKT, those are molecules that they are used to, to uh, wake up the follicles. Uh, I would probably never do it in, a, in an oncologic patient because those growth factors, those uh, molecules, uh, they are also well known to induce cancer. So they could potentially induce a, a relapse. Uh, but uh, as I tell you, if we stick to the facts, uh, the answer is we don't know because nobody has tried in oncologic patients yet. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, explaining this. Um, definitely uh, interesting um, to know that. Yes. And well, let me go to the next question right here. So is there any point for a woman in her 50s who has had multiple IVFs and multiple miscarriages go through ovarian rejuvenation or just go straight to a donor and surrogate? Uh, this is this is a, a question that is uh, is asked many many times by patients. Uh, in fact, uh, in our hands, I have uh, I have never seen a patient over the age of 38 being pregnant after doing ovarian rejuvenation techniques. And this is why at the very beginning of the of the lecture I explained to you that 
ovarian rejuvenation techniques, they do not modify the genetics of the embryos. Uh, I'm not saying that it could not be possible, uh, especially in younger, uh, in younger patients, let's say in between 38 and maybe 40, 41. But the problem is that these techniques, they only increase the number of follicles. And the problem is that and we have a lot of statistics in our clinics because we do a lot of genetic testing. So when, when you are, for example, let's say 40, in average, you need nine eggs to generate one euploid embryo. So even if you can increase the number of eggs instead of having no eggs and you can increase by one, maybe by two, it will take a lot to get to that point in which you can generate a normal, genetically normal embryo. Uh, and after those ages, especially after the age of, of, of uh, 43, 44, the percentage of normal embryos is even lower. Therefore, the amount of eggs that you need to generate uh, a normal embryo at the age, for example, of 45, is usually the average, the average amount of eggs is around uh, 68, 69, uh, and that's the average. Uh, therefore, I would say that if you are 50, and you have already undergone the process of IVF, and you have been through probably uh, very tough uh, experiences uh, uh, in terms of results, uh, going for egg donation would be the wiser option, doubtless. Undergoing surrogacy or not, uh, it depends a lot on the physical conditions of the mother and also on the uterine characteristics. I, 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 would, I would not dare to give you an opinion without knowing your case uh, specifically uh, and you also have to take into account the legal uh, the, the legal conditions of the different countries because in many countries undergoing an embryo transfer after the age of 50 is something that that you will not be allowed to do unfortunately okay perfect thank you so much for uh, explaining the details to to this and for your question as well of course um okay and there's a question actually that has been um repeated already so let me show you is this procedure done in london uh, the the surgeries uh and, and also the the infusion of the factors uh we do it in our central surgical facilities although the patients they are mainly centralized here with me in london mm -hmm. so okay. if, if you are ever interested i would recommend you uh to have a a, a visit with me or or even if you do not live here in London, we can we can even organize a, a consultation on the phone. In fact, because as I told you, these these techniques they go under the umbrella of a of a research project. These consultations they are they are free of charge, and okay. uh, and in fact, what we usually do is that we we assess first if you could benefit of of this type of techniques based on your specific characteristics, and and if if you cannot, we will explain you why. And, and you will not need to bother to, to come for a consultation if you don't want to. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, for this as well. Now we are having a longer question, so let's have a look at it. Okay. So before proceeding with PRP, the numbers were AMH 1.02, etc. You can see it, of course, the first month after PRP, the figures was AMH 1.2. Uh, because my doctor believed that the numbers will be better next month, we decided to proceed with ovarian stimulation next month. However, next month, the AMH was lower, 1.07. So the outcome was 6x. So questions one whether we should proceed with stimulation from the first month and second do you believe it is worthy to repeat prp process before next stimulation well in fact uh with with uh, an image of of one uh nanogram per milliliter i would never do any type of ovarian rejuvenation technique this kind of results six eggs is above the average results that we usually have in, in our clinics, in a daily practice with this type of, of characteristics. So probably uh, what, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this you need to discuss it with your consultant, of course, and, and he will need to explain you why why to do the procedure, but but having C-sex with an AMH of, of one or, or one, 1.2 uh, after, the, after the first month uh, is something that is completely, um, feasible uh, without uh, without any other intervention, just with an ovarian stimulation. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for answering this question and for your detailed question for sure as well. Um, is this technique currently available or is it still on any experimental? If available, what is the cost and the availability to a single woman in her 40s? Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in our group, uh, we do not, we do not do, we have decided not to offer this procedure in, in women uh, above the age of 38. And this is because the reason that I previously explained. Uh, the efficacy of the technique is so, 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 so low that uh, we feel that it's not ethical to do it. Uh, in fact, uh, as I told you, I, I think I mentioned it during the presentation, with uh, more than uh, 38 patients included in the randomized control trial of low iron reserve. And um, nowadays, more than 40 patients, including in the prospective court of uh, patients with premature ovarian insufficiency, we have not seen a single uh, pregnancy in patients over the age of 38. Again, I'm not saying that is impossible, but it's very, very unlikely. Okay. Thank you again for uh, the details you have provided. Um, let's have a look. There's another question right here. So my MH is 1.07. I'm 38. My doctor told me ovarian graduation will not help me. My AMH is still high. I thought it would help me to create more eggs than usual five. I was wrong. Uh, yes, uh, probably, probably you were wrong. I think your doctor was right this time, uh, Anna. Um, in fact, this is kind of the same question uh, that the previous patient asked. When you when you have already an established ovarian reserve, even if it's low, the ovarian rejuvenation techniques, they will add very little. And uh, having uh, an IMH of one, and probably the average, the average, for example, in our hands, the average amount of eggs, mature eggs that we get with patients with an IMH of, of 1.07 is in between six and seven but it can differ a little bit between, between techniques or, or between clinics. Um, for, for, that, for that amount of, of uh, AMH, that's a very, very good number of eggs. And by doing things like uh, infusion of PRPs or ovarian fragmentation or ASCOT, you are not going to increase significantly uh, the number of eggs. You could increase potentially the number of follicles, but as I showed you in the result of our randomized control trial, it didn't result in an, in an increase of, uh, of the number of eggs. And that was exactly the same population with, the, with characteristics similar to yours. So my advice would be, as your doctor has told you, not to do it. Uh, the, good, the good news is that in a patient with your age, 38 years old, usually the amount of eggs that you need to generate a normal embryo, normal euploid embryo, is about uh, is about five, so probably with just one round of IVF, you will have pregnancy rates uh, that they in a good clinic they would be over sixty percent. Perfect. Thank you so much again for clarifying this uh, to us as well. Okay, there's another question here. So, how long before a post IVF cycle should ovarian rejuvenation be done for best results? This is this is a very good question. And this is a question that uh, I would say that a couple of years, three years ago, I couldn't have answered. Nowadays, I could tell you that we see the better increase in terms of follicles in between two months and four months uh, after the procedure. So in fact, the rationale is not uh, how, how long before should I do the technique, but how long should I wait to get good results because the key is also doing a proper monitorization. So obviously this is a mean and uh, most of the patients will be in that range. But what if you are a patient in which that increase in follicles happens a little bit earlier or a little bit after? What we should not do is to lose that chance. So a very important thing after doing any of these approaches, I think is to, to do a proper follow-up including ultrasound scans and sometimes even blood tests. Thanks once again for answering this uh, question. Okay, so in such case, so who are the ideal candidates for ovarian rejuvenation? Typically, what age, AMH level? 
Uh, in fact, I would I would say that with the data that we have nowadays, ideal candidates could be patients below the age of 38 with uh, with clinical symptomatology of uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, which means uh, menstruations, uh, a space more than four months, FSH levels above 25. But this obviously can vary within the different cycles. Usually these patients, they have AMH levels that they are undetectable or very, very low, usually below, below 5 picomolar, which is the equivalent to 0 0.7 nanograms per ml. Perfect. Thank you so much again for answering this question. And uh, well, in such case, you kind of answered this, but uh, if you could add anything, is this a good procedure for 42 no history of fertility treatment? Uh, that's a, a good question, which I cannot answer. Uh, talking about patients of a certain age, especially if they don't have any previous history of, of infertility, is, is virtually impossible. Uh, uh, we see patients every day in the clinic, age 42, even, even older, getting pregnant with their own eggs without doing anything else. Because yes, usually age correlates with a decrease in ovarian reserve, but not always. So my advice, if you are 42 and you have never had a fertility assessment, my advice is that you do a fertility assessment first and you discuss your options one-to-one -one with your doctor. Because uh, you could be 40, 42 and you could have, let's say, an ovarian reserve with 15 follicles, which I see uh, not so rarely. Uh, or on the other hand, you could be 42 and have no follicles or maybe one or two follicles. In such case, probably my recommendation would, would be to go for egg donation. Uh, so, just given your age, it looks, uh, I mean, the prognosis probably is going to be, well, it's not probably, it's not sh for sure it's going to be worse than in a younger patient. But having said that, there is still room for variability within the different age groups. So, my advice is that you look at other aspects such as your ovarian reserve. Otherwise, answering that question is, is impossible. And your opinion on this as well, of course. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, and um, there's another question right here. Any experience of the use of mesenchymal stem cells from Watson jelly of the umbilical cord or the use of exosomes for ovarian rejuvenation? How do you infuse the cells? Okay, so there, there are a couple of questions here. First, the use of the mesenchymal stem cells from uh, Watson jelly. Uh, yes, uh, there are some groups uh, who have done it, but mainly uh, in mice models. So, so it's still experimental, but the principle would be the same as infusing cells from uh, peripheral blood. The question is, what is cheaper? What is easier? Uh, how do we infuse the cells? What we do is that we get the cells out from the bone marrow by injecting something called GSF. Is a product that we use when we do bone marrow transplantations, or, or let's say peripheral blood uh, cells transplantations. So we mobilize the cells from the bones to the peripheral blood, and then we take them out with a machine. And what we have done is that we have concentrated those cells, and we have introduced directly into the ovary by using a very, very, very fine catheter that goes into the blood vessels, okay? This is a way of doing it. Nowadays, in our group, we are doing a, a randomized controlled trial in which we are experimenting another way of doing that, which is very simple, which is just injecting the growth factors that mobilize the cells out of the bone marrow, the GSF, and see if that can induce the same effect. Instead of taking all the cells out, concentrate them and put them back, we just let them go to the peripheral blood and go to your whole body. 
and we are trying to see if that can cause the same effect as by doing the apheresis. Uh, that could be very interesting because then the process would be very simple. Could you just be given an injection during five days. All right, perfect. Thanks so much again for your answer to this question. We have more questions coming, but uh, so let me go to the next uh, one right here. I'm 44, postmenopausal for three years and had a successful uh, pregnancy last year with a baby boy, now four months. Can I do the ovarian rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenation still be possible pregnant using my own ex? Uh, again, uh, my advice would be not to do it. At least in our in our experience, uh, as I explained before, uh, we, we didn't see any pregnancy after the age of 38. Uh, maybe case by case, we could consider go up to the age of 40, uh, but not within the research protocols that we have nowadays. Uh, it would, would be an exceptional case, but I think 44 is, is, is far too late for this type of techniques and basically because of the chromosomal abnormalities linked to age. So even if we increase slightly the number of follicles, they will never bypass of the effect of age on the chromosomes. Okay, thank you so much again for answering this one. And well, there's a question which you, which is a preferred technique for rejuvenation that you consider to be most promising? Well, in fact, there is no, there is no trial comparing the, the three different approaches. I would say that in terms of uh, of uh, making things simple, probably uh, the, the, uh, the PRPs would be the simplest, but unfortunately, uh, I would say that despite the fact that it has been used for many years, there's no a single control trial published yet, which makes me think that is not as effective as they claim it is. Uh, in my own experience, I have worked a lot with the with the ASCOT, with the stem cell infusion, and also with the ovarian fragmentation. I, I think that in a long term we will probably see similar results, but for the moment being, the technique for which we have more data available by far is the ovarian fragmentation technique. And therefore, that's the one I would recommend you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your recommendation to uh, this as well. All right. And now let me have a look. It's actually a follow up to your answer. Please clar clarify. Did you say for 43 year old, 68 uh, eggs will be needed on average to find one good egg? It's not, it's not to find one good egg, it's to get one normal haploid embryo, an embryo with 46 chromosomes. So, mm -hmm. I can I can give you the sad statistics uh, at, for example the, the statistics in our hands of course because then these statistics they can vary a little bit depending on the technique that they are used in the different labs and and so on but for example for a for a woman uh, at the age of 43 years old uh, 43 uh, no, I tell you 68. No, that that was not correct. It's up to 60, up to 68. So in average, is 26 eggs, and it can go up to 68. Okay, perfect. Thank you for providing such details as well. And let me uh, go to next question so ovarian rejuvenation means better number of follicles but no better quality of embryos uh, yes yes uh, essentially that's what we know nowadays perfect thank you so much that's a very, that's a very straight way of explaining it okay perfect thank you so much um again for this um all right so Here's the next one. My female partner is 40, AMA 0.7, and she had four egg retrievals each time she had egg retrieved one time two. Altogether, five eggs, two embers were created of poor quality. I didn't get pregnant. Would this make sense with such outcome to do ovarian rejuvenation for her? Is she the right candidate? Uh, again, uh, in our experience, I would say no. Uh, it could be tried, but my advice would be not to do it. Mm -hmm. 
and and it's basically because because of 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 the age which will imply a higher number of chromosomal abnormalities and and also as as we were responding to the previous question we will not see an improvement in terms of embryo quality so the main problems that you had in your previous cycles we are not going to bypass them okay thank you again for um this advice uh right and let's have a look at it you have already kind of mentioned this right but does prp help improve egg quality i had seven fight cycles all down to poor embryo quality there is no sperm issues so doctors are, say, are saying it's egg quality i'm 35. uh no the answer is no or a lot at least no with the data that that we have nowadays uh, in fact is as I told you, it's very surprising. There's very little data regarding the use of PRPs and reproductive outcomes. In fact, the, the only study that I could find with proper information was the, the Iranian study. Even the Greek group, which, I mean, they usually claim that they have done a lot of cases. I, I could never see a data regarding reproductive outcomes or embryo development data. Uh, so if you are 35 years old, in order to improve the quality of your eggs, th there are other things that could be evaluated uh, because it's, I mean, obviously th there are very difficult cases at that age, but usually patients below the age of 40 years old, uh, the egg quality problems sooner or later, they can be bypassed. Uh, probably, the, the first thing that you that you have to discuss with your doctor is how the embryo is treated in the lab and the conditions in the lab. That makes a big, big difference. And I tell you that based on my daily experience. We, we have patients every day coming from, uh, uh, I mean, with backgrounds of, of many failed previous IVF cycles, which they, they get easily pregnant, especially if they are that young. Uh, Obviously, there could also be conditions that motivate that uh, quality problem. And if so, what your doctor should do is to focus on treating the conditions motivating the, the quality problem. Uh, there are also some medical interventions that could be evaluated to improve the quality. And there are also stimulation protocols that could potentially improve equality. But uh, as I mentioned from the very beginning of the, of the talk, uh, ovarian rejuvenation techniques, they are mainly aiming to increase the number of eggs, not the, the quality of the eggs. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying us. Uh, this you don't need to answer because, of course, you had just done it. Uh, so it doesn't improve the quality, mm -hmm. of course. But as you see, this is quite a question. Yeah, that, 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 I mean, it's, it's, these questions, obviously, they they are frequently asked because, of course. because those are the, 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 the problems that we usually face in, in our daily practice mm -hmm. and yes. people want, want solutions for those. Definitely, of course. Perfect. Thank you for... There, there are many other things to improve equality. Uh, I don't know if you have organized any seminar on equality, but, but it's a very interesting topic. Yes, definitely. We had some already. We will definitely have more. <laughs> so this is those kind of topics are definitely very interesting um, and well, very lots of patients definitely need to ask questions and find out on all aspects as well. And there's another interesting question right here. Is there any training course for doctors to learn the procedure? Uh, well, I have to say that I Myself, I learned it from uh, Kazuhiro Kawamura and, and Aaron Shue already in 2013. Uh, we, in our group, we train doctors to do it, uh, but we try to keep it uh, restricted because also the experience is very important. So, so for example, we are a group of three people that we deal with all these patients. Uh, and we also have a strict protocol that our colleagues in, in, in the different IVI clinics, they follow uh, to, to do the follow-up of the patients. Uh, obviously, because those techniques, they are, they are very new. Uh, the more cases you do, the more experience you have. So it's not very productive to teach a lot of people to do it at the very beginning, because then each of those doctors will have very little experience. Yes, 
perfect thank you for for your question and of course your answer to this and we have another one right here so for a 42 with no history of fertility treatment as she just started tcc six months ago will you suggest trying with own eggs first or go to donor eggs straight away so this is this is a, the typical question that that Patients are, uh, in this age group will always ask when they come for a first consultation, which is a very legitimate question. The answer is, it depends on what you want and it depends on what you expect. But yes, you could try a treatment with your own eggs. I would say that I would not give you a very strong recommendation until I know your ovarian reserve. And based on your ovarian reserve, what I would do is that basically calculate your probabilities of having a pregnancy with your own eggs versus the probabilities of having a pregnancy with donated eggs, which probably are going to be higher. But obviously, you already know that. So it's more a matter of how much do you want to risk or how, how much time do you want to invest uh, or how easy or how, how difficult it could be. Uh, I, I really respect uh, the, the, the opinion of the patients and I believe in giving the information and helping the patient to, to take a shared decision. Uh, so just by knowing that you have 42 years old, uh, I, I couldn't tell you do this or do that. I can tell you that probably your chances they are higher with donated eggs, of course. Uh, but then there is also room uh, for uh, for a lot of aspects to be taken into consideration. So knowing a little bit more about your case, probably we could discuss it further. Perfect. Thank you so much again for this. And just wanted to, to remind everyone that if you would like to get in touch with uh, Dr. Uh, Cesar and his team as well, of course, you can also use this uh, link. I will send it to you right now. And uh, there is an option to simply contact the, the clinic. And of course, uh, Dr. Cesar, and that way you are able to provide all the details and get some more uh, answers as well, I'm sure. So you can go ahead and do it. In the meantime, let me go to the next question. Uh, what are the parameters that determine if ovarian rejuvenation has worked? You mentioned, mentioned monitoring blood tests following the procedure. Would you basically perfectly measure antral follicle count and serum AMH? Anything else? Well, uh, to be honest, and I think for these kind of things, I, I pretty much black or white. As a doctor, I would only tell you that the treatment has worked if you have a baby at home. And probably this is something that we should do in every single aspect of reproductive medicine, because at the end of the process, that's what probably you are aiming for. You, you want to have a baby. Uh, obviously, we use the AMH, we use the antral follicle count mainly to monitor in between if we can do the, the IVF treatment, and, and is, of course, this is what we call an interim uh, marker of success, but it's not the definitive marker of success. The only successful outcome of any fertility treatment is having a healthy baby at home. Yes, that is true. Very true. So thank you so much again for, uh, for answering this question. And uh, well, you already kind of answers, but answered that, right? So, is there any proposed procedure to help over forties? Uh, again, it, it depends a lot on what it comes together with forties. But let's say that in a normal or very usual scenario of a patient in the forties with a low ovarian reserve, uh, yes, there is things we can do. In fact. Probably this is the, the, the type of patients that we see in the clinic uh, more, more often. The average age of our patients is 39.2 years old. Uh, basically, what I usually say to my patients is that if the main problem is the, the, the low ovarian reserve, the simplest way of bypassing that lack of follicles is by repeating the, the treatment. Obviously, uh, I would say that the main, the main drawback of repeating a, a treatment, and let's face it, is the cost. So by decreasing the cost of the treatment, we can make the treatment more affordable 
and therefore we can repeat it and eventually get to the number of follicles and the number of eggs, mature eggs, that we need to generate normal embryos. Uh, we can do that by doing uh, ovarian stimulations who do not require a lot of medication, uh, even no medication or very little medication. Uh, we can uh, decrease costs by by accumulating oocytes sometimes, uh, or uh, we can even decrease costs by um, by not putting uh, the wrong embryo back. Uh, so there is there's many things that we can do. We can also, uh, and this is again probably you have seen that in other seminars, uh, try to uh, to do medical therapies together. With the, with the stimulation protocol or before the stimulation protocol to prepare the ovary better for uh, in terms of outcomes and when it comes to egg and embryo quality. Although all this is quite debatable, I would say, but yes, there are, there are many things that we can do. All right, thank you so much for this again uh, as well. And there's another question. Will you suggest mini IVF or full IVF for 43 year old, no history of fertility, all tests say all is fine, but AMH not yet done. When do you consider mini IVF to be, bet to be better than full IVF for over 40s? So in our practice, if you have enough follicles to do a full ovarian stimulation, I would always do a full ovarian stimulation. There is a misconception, uh, which is probably a result of old, all the studies uh, in which people tend to think that the more you stimulate the ovaries, the worse is going to be the outcome. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, what we know nowadays is that in normal responders, the more eggs you have, the more chances of having embryos and the more chances of having a successful pregnancy. Obviously, this is not the case if your ovaries, they do not respond well to the medication. In those cases, doing a mini IVF, what people call a mini IVF, or a mild stimulation, or a modified natural cycle, because there are many uh, variations of those protocols, could be a better option. And therefore, uh, we would suggest you to do that. So basically, again, that, that would depend a lot on your ovarian reserve. If your ovarian reserve is very low, probably a mini IVF would be a better option. If you have a good ovarian reserve, the more eggs you have, the earlier you will get a normal embryo, the earlier you will get pregnant. And therefore, a full ovarian stimulation would be better. Perfect. Thank you so much again for that advice. All right. And um, there's another question. What about cytoplasmic transfer? Using ovarian rejuvenation to get more follicles than using a younger woman's cytoplasma? This is a, this is a, a very good question. But as far as I know, uh, there, are, there are some groups who have licenses to do uh, research in mitochondrial transfer, which is a very specific of cytoplasmic transfer because you do not transfer all the cytoplasm, you only transfer small parts, small organelles called mitochondria, which they are meant to produce energy. Uh, the cytoplasmic transfer uh, in more in most of the occidental countries, I, I would say that nowadays is banned, especially given the, the outcomes uh, that we saw in the United States, in the United States of America. Uh, they, they did a, a couple of trials a uh, long time ago, and they were babies uh, born with reported abnormalities. So, so th this type of treatments, they are not doable nowadays. Maybe what you are talking about is, is the transfer of uh, mitochondria. But the transfer of mitochondria, the results are also very contro controversial. Uh, we have uh, our own experience. We did a, a, a randomized control trial in our IVI clinic in Valencia, and the results, they were not as good as we expected. OK, thank you so much. So that means it's still like uh, still being researched, so nothing for certain, let's say. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very frustrating because obviously uh, you as patients won't answers and you want answers as soon as possible obviously and, and we would like to provide you with those answers quicker but but unfortunately to conduct research in a proper way takes time 
And, and sometimes, especially when it comes to fertility, the patients, they don't have that time. So I understand that it's frustrating. But sometimes we just need to wait until something is, you know, more thoroughly checked, let's say, right? right? Especially what we are putting in danger is, is the, the health of your future baby. Because at the very end of the process, we are here to, to help you to have a, a healthy family. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's, that's true. All right. So next question, let me have a look at it. So here it is. What do you mean? It is a simple procedure injection within five days of what? Could you um, tell us a bit on that? You have mentioned. Well, that, yeah. When, when, when I was talking, I think that uh, Marie is referring to the explanation of, uh, of the new randomized control trial that we are doing uh, for the mobilization of the stem cells. Basically what we do in this study is that we are comparing two ways of uh, of doing the, the the mobilization of the stem cells. We are mobilizing the stem cells as we have always done it by injecting five days of GSF uh, and then doing an apheresis of those cells that they are in the peripheral blood, taking them out, concentrate them and putting them back directly into the ovary. Thus, the classic way, so to speak, but there is also uh, another way of trying to do it, which is that we inject the GSF and instead of taking the cells out, concentrate them and put them back, we just let them be in your body. So we mobilize the cells out of the bone marrow and we let them be in your peripheral blood. That's what I mean by, uh, by doing a simpler procedure. But what we are doing now is to test if that's really efficient or not, because we don't know it yet. That's, that's a, a study that is currently ongoing. Okay, thank you for clarifying this one to us as well. Next question is here. Will ovarian regeneration sorry, help with the effects of menopause, such as headaches, high blood pressure, and just feeling blah in general? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, the, the Greek group uh, uh, have, have, um, have published uh, some, some papers regarding the, the use of PRPs in terms of uh, menopausal symptoms. And uh, I can tell you that in our experience, I have not shown the data, but most of the patients who underwent the ovarian fragmentation procedure, they resume uh, menstruations again. But uh, as a reproductive uh, medicine consultant, I wouldn't recommend you to do that just to, to, to treat the menopausal symptoms. Basically because sooner or later, the effect will stop. So you will do it and three months, six months down the line, you will be in a square one. Uh, and also because there is a simpler, safer and cheaper way of doing it, which is the, the HRT. Nowadays, HRT has a very bad reputation, but in fact, there are very, very good ways, very similar to the natural ways of administration with not strong molecules that can mimic the natural cycle very well and which will have amazing effects when it comes to uh, mitigate uh, the most important uh, menopausal symptoms. I'm very, very safe. Perfect. Thanks so much again for that uh, answer to this question. And we have another one. We have like few questions left. We will be slowly finishing. So uh, if you have any final questions, go ahead and type them in right now as well. And so, uh, so do you? How do you collect over twenty six eggs, multiple IVL cycles, or multiple retrievals, and they frozen till fertilization? Sorry, I'm new to this. Uh... I, I don't know if, if there is any mistake in the question or I, I don't understand it. Uh, over 46 eggs, I, I assume that this is related to when I have, when I have uh, mentioned the fact that in the age group of 43, we need 26 eggs in average to generate I, one employed egg. I assume so. Yes. Uh, yes, I believe so. Of course, you know, if you have any other comments to this, just type it in, okay? So we can, so we will make sure to. I will, I will answer the way I think it is. And, okay. and if I'm wrong, please feel free to, to make the question again. Uh, 
So, so basically, for example, let's say that we need to, to, to get 26 eggs in a patient over the age of 40. Uh, basically, uh, what we will do probably most of the time is to do multiple ovarian stimulations. Not, not necessarily. I, I mean, the week before before we, we finish our our um, our egg collections because of the COVID, uh, I, I did an egg collection on a patient age 45 years old, and we retrieved 18 eggs. So that's that's the kind of things that can happen. But in general, after the age of 40, we will have less eggs. So the way of getting to that amount of eggs usually implies repeating the ovarian stimulation process. And by doing so, we will get the mature eggs that we need. Then what we do with those eggs, freeze them or fertilize them directly? That depends a lot on the plant that it has been traced with the, with the woman. In general, freezing the eggs uh, could make the treatment uh, cheaper. And then at the very end, when you have collected all the 26, you fertilize them, all of them together. But you don't have to forget that these are statistics. And among these patients who needed, in average, because this is an average, 26 eggs, there were also patients who needed more, up to 68. But there were also patients with 13, 14 eggs. They already had a normal embryo. So how can you know if you are in the group of patients who needed more, who needed less, or in the average? Before starting the process, you cannot know it. So what we would usually do is that we will assess with you your specific situation. We will balance the pros, the cons. We will give you information about costs. Because another option would be to fertilize the eggs when you get them straight away. Because it could happen that after the first ovarian stimulation, you already have a, a, a good embryo. And therefore, you would be spending your money in other cycles that maybe you will not need. Yes, there's a follow-up right here as well. You can see it. So, ah, yeah. So, so yeah, that was the that was the the question. So, in fact, it's not, it's not that you get that amount in one collection. You usually need more. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying this to us and also for answering the question. And uh, we have few questions left. So let me go to the next one. My AMH when I was beginning with IVF at the age of 39 was 1.1. After one year and several stimulation protocols, it dropped down to 0 0.3. Another year later, it was surprising, surprisingly 143. So even more than at the very beginning, the tests were done in the same laboratory and same measures. What do you think is the reason the laboratory excused an, uh, excluded an error? Well, in fact, I mean, AMH, is a, is a marker, an ovarian reserve marker that is much better than FSH. We all know that and it's more reliable, but it does not mean that it's perfect. So nowadays we know that uh, there, there is a slight variations in AMH levels uh, that they can be related to the weight of the patient. So if you have gain or lose weight during this time, that could affect the AMH levels. Uh, also, uh, the fact of being under contraception, I don't know if you were under contraception before the first measurement or later, the, the ovarian stimulation process sometimes can also affect the AMH levels. There are some authors that they have published about that. Very, not, not a lot, I would say little, but it can. And, and also uh, the, what we call the, the coefficient of variation of the assays. The assays, regardless of what your lab has told you, and ruling out the presence of a mistake, of an error, there is also variations, inter-assay and intra-assay. And if you put all that together, that will explain why, uh, why the results are different. It can also happen, but I don't know if it's the case or not, that in the lab that, that you are using for, for your AMH test, they have changed uh, the, the assays that they are using from a second generation to a third generation assay. Maybe that can also be the case. Okay, uh, there's a follow up question. So, I mean, additional uh, information, in fact. So, uh, my weight has not changed. I have a normal weight, only was doing several IVF cycles, mainly natural cycles, and 
just give me a second there's another at this time i have had an ivf stimulation and had 11 eggs collected only one reached an early blastocyst stage but no pregnancy i i will i will tell you that in such case probably uh i would say i would say that this is a a, a measurement problem it's a problem with the lab i'm not saying that they have done an error but uh, but also the time that the blood has been leftover. I mean, there are many variables that, that can explain that. But especially if you have a, an ovarian stimulation with 11 eggs collected, that, that does not match at all your AMH levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, luckily for you. OK. Thank you so much for uh, that uh, information. Yeah, that's definitely um, useful, I'm sure. Uh, just give me a second. There is a OK, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So there's another question right here. Is there any suitable procedure with women who are PCOS and have OHSS issues? Yes, they are. Uh, to be honest, and this is a practice. Uh, I mean, it's, for me, it's, it's hard to talk about this because because we shouldn't be talking about this. OHSS should not exist any longer. I remember exactly the last time I saw a severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. I was still a resident doctor 15 years ago. I have not seen any ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in my years as a consultant in my practice, because nowadays we have something called antagonists. And antagonists should be the ovarian stimulation protocol of choice in patients at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation which means that if we do an ovarian stimulation with an antagonist protocol, we, we can avoid the use of ACG, pregnancy hormone, to do the trigger. I'm sure that you are familiar with Ovitrail, with Gonasi. If we avoid the use of those drugs, it's virtually impossible to have an ovarian stimulation syndrome. So having an ovarian stimulation syndrome I mean, it's only our fault. It's the fault of the doctors. Uh, we, we should not see any ovarian stimulation syndrome, even in uh, patients with PCOS, because we can avoid the, PC, the OHSS by using an agonist trigger and by deferring the transfer. So we freeze the embryos and we put them back in the following cycle. And by doing that, you will avoid I, I don't like to say 100% because 100% that's not existing medicine, but almost 100% of the ovarian stimulation, ovarian hyperstimulation syndromes. Okay, perfect. Thank you um, so much. Sorry, there is like, um, if you could just tell us, uh, this is the same patient. What kind of protocol? This is what we call a, a, an antagonist protocol. What okay. people used to call short protocols. Okay. And obviously, most important, with a GnRH trigger. Okay. I don't know if I can. I can type also. Yes. Uh, yes, you can. It. If you. Okay, and there's a, actually a follow-up right here from the patient. So I had H O O H. Assess all my cycles during period 2013 and 16. I'm very sorry to, to hear that. I think I think that's something that nowadays shouldn't happen. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for um, the the answer is just here in the chat section as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, as I mentioned, there are like a few questions left. Uh, I two of them. But uh, let me just go to the next one. Here it is. Do you use DHEA and or coenzyme on Q10 in patients with low ovarian reserve? If you do, for how long before the IVF? That's a very good question. Um, and this is a question that we also face a lot in our daily consultations. So in general, we do not recommend it because there is not still enough evidence behind the use of um, DHEA or uh, coenzyme Q10. But having said that, the lack of evidence does not necessarily mean the lack of effect. Sometimes it means that nobody has done that 
study proving that the intervention is a valid intervention. Uh, DH, DHEA has to be used at least three months before ovarian stimulation. For coenzyme Q10, there is less data regarding the duration. Uh, therefore, what I would suggest you if you were my patient is that you have to balance the risks and the benefits. Uh, when it comes to DHEA, the secondary effects, the side effects could be a little bit annoying, such as the hirsutism, the, 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 basically the hair in the face, uh, acne, and for some people that's very annoying. My advice would be then don't, don't do it. Uh, coenzyme Q10 is fairly inexpensive, no side effects, why not? I, what I cannot tell you is that it's going to really make a difference, but probably it's not going to harm you either. Perfect. Thank you so much again for that. And I'm just looking. Oh, okay. The patient has just asked, the previous one, if you could um, explain what G -N G -N -R -H trigger means. Uh, uh, trigger. Trigger. So that's... Uh, basically, when, when we do an ovarian stimulation protocol, what we do is that we give to your ovaries FSH to stimulate the ovary, plus minus small amounts of LH. Those are the, the hormones that they stimulate the ovary naturally. And when the follicles they are fully grown, we need to send a signal to your ovaries so they release the, the oocytes, although we will do the collection before the oocytes they are released. But during that process of releasing the oocytes, the last steps of maturation will happen. Well, in nature, that happens due to a huge increase in LH. Okay? Unfortunately, that increase in LH is very, 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 very difficult to mimic by giving you external LH. We need we need a lot. We need a lot. Just to give you an idea, uh, the doses of LH that we can use in a normal stimulation protocol, they are about 150, 300 units a day. And what we need the day of the trigger is more than 10,000 units all of a sudden. So instead of doing that, what we have classically do in IVF is to give pregnancy hormone, ACG, because the ACG mimics the structure of the LH. It does not mimic, they, they share a chain. It's a protein that is uh, a combination of two, it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of two proteins. So one of those proteins, one of those chains uh, is exactly the same. And therefore the pregnancy hormone has an LH-like activity and it remains in the blood for a longer period of time. Therefore we use pregnancy hormone as a substitute of the LH trigger, but that can cause ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is another way of doing the trigger, which is by giving the analog of a molecule called GnRH. GnRH is the hormone that in your body will induce the trigger of LH. So it's a hormone that is produced by your brain and it will go to your pituitary gland. So instead of giving you a huge amount of LH, what we will do is that we will give you a small amount of the hormone that induces in your gland the huge release of LH. And by doing that, we will avoid the use of pregnancy hormone and therefore we will avoid the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Perfect. Thank you so uh, much. Okay, there's a follow-up, so just let me show you. What brand name of this? Supercure. Supercure. It's called Supercure. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again for. It, it has been used a lot for many other things in, in reproductive medicine. I'm sure your consultant will know it. Uh, can you spell it? Is it possible for you to write it down just in case? Yeah, perfect. One milliliter should be enough. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So in the meantime, we, we just received a few, like two, three questions. So let me get to them. Um, okay. What 
dose you give when it's it comes to one, one milliliter. Okay, perfect. Ah, DHA and Q10. Uh, so basically, uh, for for the DHEA, as I told you, I personally do not recommend DHEA. So and and you know that is not a registered uh, drug in in the UK. Uh, for the Q10, I usually use 200 milligrams uh, every 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's one more thing here. What can we do to improve uh, SA, especially motility and morphology? Motility and morphology, I, I, I assume that this is for the sperm, right? Uh, so, again, there is, there is a, a, a lot of complements that you can uh, find in the market that will improve the sperm parameters. I will tell you something. The most important thing by far is to have a healthy lifestyle, which means if you smoke, stop smoking 100%. If you drink, stop drinking. And if you cannot stop drinking because we all have a social life, at least decrease it a lot. Have a healthy diet. Eat a little bit of everything. Try to decrease uh, the amount of processed carbohydrates. Eat fruit, vegetables, cereals, but also meat, eggs, fish. And the most important thing of all, together with non-smoking, practice at least 30 to 40 minutes of aerobic activity four days a week. If you do all that, probably you get to an antioxidant endogenous activity that will bypass any of that, uh, of those uh, supplements that you can find in the market. Uh, if, you, if you want to, to use uh, supplements, there, there is a lot of uh, supplements that, that they are out there uh, that combine different products. Most of them, uh, they have uh, antioxidant properties and those are mainly directed to people with, uh, I would say, bad, bad lifestyles or that they endogenous have a, a high oxygen reactive species production. Uh, if you have a very healthy lifestyle, be careful when taking antioxidants because uh, if you take a lot, instead of having uh, oxidative stress, you could go to the other stream, which is what we call reactive uh, uh, um, stress. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Relax. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you so much. And so can you see this right here as well? Yes, uh, sperm improvement with Voltaren and Viagra. In fact, sometimes the the, the uh, if, if you have been recommended to use Voltaren, my advice probably would be that you you discuss it with a uh, with an andrologist because sometimes the problems in morphology and and also in um, in, uh, in motility or, or the concentration of sperm they are the result of an inflammatory process. And if you use products such as Voltaren, this is what we call diclofenac. Uh, the diclofenac is a very powerful anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, but again, it's a drug that is not free of side effects and it will only be useful if you have an inflammatory process. And if you have an inflammatory process, then probably there is a cause. So my advice is that you discuss it with an andrologist or with your reproductive medicine doctor because if there is an inflammation in your testicles, that should be uh, assessed and treated. I mean, treating the cause, not only the inflammation, but the cause behind the inflammation. And Viagra, uh, again, Viagra uh, has uh, properties that they are um, related to the increase of vascularization. It's a very powerful vasodilator. So it has been used uh, for many things in reproductive medicine, but mainly uh, for increasing the, the thickness of the endometrium. When it comes to sperm production, uh, I have to be very honest with you. I have never heard about the use of Viagra and, and sperm parameters, but what it will help for sure is to, to have a, a probably more satisfactory uh, um, sex life and, and, and 
and probably to, to perform better. Perfect. Thank you so much for explaining this. It's a follow up or actually uh, could you just have a look? So if there is a possibility with vitamin C and vitamin E. Again, yes, probably. And this is again because of the antioxidant uh, properties of vitamin C and also tocopherol. So if I have vitamin C and vitamin E, they are included in, in a lot of these uh, supplement products that you can find in the market. Okay, and how about clomid? Yes, clomid and sperm. Yes, it can it can be a treatment, but only for a very specific group of patients, and those are patients with very low FSH levels, because FSH in women uh, they induce uh, follicular growth, while in men FSH levels are uh, are involved in sperm production, and there are men that they don't have enough sperm or enough good sperm because of the lack of FSH. When we give Clomid, Clomid increases your endogenous levels of FSH, and therefore that can help to the, that can help to the sperm production. But I would not recommend you to take Clomid without uh, having an assessment by a reproductive medicine doctor, checking your FSH levels, et cetera, et cetera, because otherwise it could be counterproductive. Okay. Perfect uh, so much again. Thank you so much for, for answering this one uh, again. Okay, and I believe this will be our final uh, question. Okay, so uh, just to let you know, if you have any questions left, left and I'm sure you do, uh, remember you can just simply use the link I have sent to you and uh, I'm sure Dr. Cesar and his team will get back to you with definitely more details as well. So the question is, in the future, what technology techniques show the most promise for women over 45? Have you heard of IVG? Yes, this is a, a very interesting field. This is a field we are we are exploring, in fact, in our group, uh, but this is not going to be a solution in the close future, unfortunately. Uh, in vitro gametogenesis is generating eggs and sperm in the lab. And it has been done in animal models. And hopefully, maybe that will be the future of, me of reproductive medicine. I completely agree. I, I, I didn't want to mention that in today's lecture. That's, that's a subject that probably is far too, uh, far too, too uh, I would say, distant from this uh, present moment, unfortunately. But yes, I, I, everything points towards that direction. Okay. Thank you so much again for that. Well, it looks like it could be another uh, topic for webinar, <laughs> possibly, um, soon as well. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Uh, perfect. So I guess that would be it for, for tonight. So thank you, Dr. Cesar, for being with us and for your time. That was definitely uh, excellent. And well, I am not the only one who thinks that. Okay, I see that there are some left questions. So don't worry, we will simply forward those questions to the doctor and you will get an answer, I'm sure. So uh, please, um, okay, <laughs> thank you. Just wanted you to see that there are very uh, there are lots of patients that are very happy with how it uh, went. So here thank you is. thank you very much to all. It was it was very interesting and it was really nice to to be able to uh, to interact so much with you. It's, it's very nice when the patients they participate so much. Yes, excellent A webinar. I just want you to see that there are more uh, patients that are very. Um, happy with how it went. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, happy to hear <laughs> there are more. Great doctor. Thank you. Super seminar. So thanks so much, everyone, for all your comments, for all of your questions, because, of course, we are here simply uh, to, to help you out as much as possible and happy that you feel more confident uh, we will definitely get back to you because uh, supplements for sa uh, someone is asked if you could repeat that is it possible for you to just simply add it i, I don't know I, I, am i am i allowed to 
to recommend supplements here. Okay. Like plants and <laughs> Understood. Understood. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do so, but but believe me, I mean, as as your uh, your uh, your pharmacist, uh, I'm sure they, they will be able to recommend you. There's no any single study saying that any supplement is better than other. I I usually work with uh, a supplement called Punalpin. I also work with another supplement called Fertilix. Uh, so there are there are different options. Exactly. Thank you so much. And um, uh, again, hope that's uh, that's okay. And to, as you can see, there are so many uh, comments. Uh, we are very happy that uh, you got your answers. So thanks so much. It has been a real pleasure to have you here. And I really do hope we can do it again. There are plenty of topics to, to discuss. Uh, so hopefully we will be able to, to do it. And uh, as there are more of those uh, comments, I just cannot help myself but show you um okay <laughs> mm, as you said uh, it's better not to reveal that but uh, but i hope that's okay and well there are more of those so um and well what can i say to this um dr cesar there are there is there anything else you would like to add no i i would say that uh thank, thank to the help of of the people who who attended the webinar it has been uh, I would say it has been very complete because if I if I forgot anything, you have probably asked for it, and, and I think we have overview everything I wanted to to discuss with you. So again, I am very sorry that we don't have more time, but if if you have other questions, feel free to to contact me, and I will try to to do my best to to answer them. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you again for all of your questions. And again, Dr. Cesar, it has been excellent. Uh, so much information, but so much useful information. And just to remind everyone, uh, this has been recorded, so you will definitely have a chance to actually uh, re-watch it within the next few days. We will upload it and you will be able to, to simply um, get in touch with the doctor, of course, as well. As I mentioned, you can simply use this link. Let me just send it to you right again, once again. And uh, there is an option for you to contact the, to ask your question and you will, your question will be sent to the team, uh, IVI team as well. And let me just remind you that we will be back here tomorrow at 6 p.m. UK time and at 8 p.m. UK time and I know some of you will join us again so thanks so much for sticking up with us uh, over and over again and well all of the past events can be found on our website myivfencers.com and if you want to know when the new uh, when the uh, webinar has been uploaded all you need to do is just simply, simply subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will be up to date again huge thank you it's uh, it took us uh almost two hours but i'm very happy with uh, how it went so thanks so much for uh, for joining and thanks so much for staying with us and for your patience as well thank you a lot have a lovely evening bye 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 <laughs>